All right. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our um, monthly meeting, the last meeting of the year. Oh, wow. Okay, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. James Lillard. I um, know Dr. Lillard because he actually um, is a professor at the institution where I received my graduate degree, and he's so super awesome person. I think he has a great journey that will um, really inspire us, especially those of us who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs. So um, I'm not going to go too much into his background because you have received his flyer and links to his um, bio as well as link to his um, company page and LinkedIn. But just wanted to um, say that he wears many hats. As you can see, he's a professor, professor of microbiology, biochemistry, and immunology an assistant dean for research at Morehouse School of Medicine. He um, has a PhD in microbiology and immunology from the University of Kentucky. And he has an executive MBA from Emory University. But we're interested more so in from Dr. Lillard is her, hear more about his um, career trajectory to become an entrepreneur um, using his scientific background, the, um, his current biotech company. So without further ado, I will allow Dr. Lillard to tell us more about himself and about his company. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you know, I wasn't going to tell you completely about my company, but I, I could, if need be. Uh, um, I was just gonna tell you about my journey uh, in academia. I'm, um, as, um, Dr. Cohen mentioned, I, I've been doing this a while. So I'm a senior associate dean for uh, research and innovation at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm, my, my, I'm an immunologist by training, but my, my research has kind of drifted from immune. I was studying uh, immunity and inflammation and now cancer. Um, been doing that for 20 years. I've, I've started different, um, different uh, companies. Um, most of them faculty startup and you know, two or three of my own. Uh, I've had funding from uh, NIH and uh, some investors from time to time. Um, I'm, a, I'm an inventor as well. Um, and I serve on different scientific and uh, medical advisory boards for either NIH, DOD, or industry, different companies. Yeah, and you know, diverse background. I, I was a double E, you know, had every intention of going to med school, but you know, thought thought it, it was so funny. I probably should have gone to med school because I would say, oh, it's just too many years in in medicine, so I'm I'm going to get a PhD instead. So that was so again, yeah, you know, was that was my first mistake, perhaps I don't know, or miscalculation. But um, I wanted, you know, it kind of leads me to my first slide. I I'm I'm sorry for this animation, but. I, I was trying, I, you know, I don't have these in any particular order, but the 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 labels, the titles in green kind of give you an idea my, from my perspective of characteristics that play, that work well as an entrepreneur, but also in academia, okay? So plays well with others, that's kind of obvious. You gotta collaborate. You gotta love learning in academia and in business. Risk bearing, you know, I think that's more of a corporate, entrepreneurial side, you know, in academia, you know, could question how, how, you know, perhaps we're risk adverse, right? Uh, innovation, very important in either, either camp. Creativity, uh, but I, I wanna add the caveat of, you know, you should all remember to uh, share your ideas strategically. Don't, you know, you don't have to give them away, but, you know, you know, I'm going to show you a slide that may put this in context. The idea is great, but without um, the sweat equity to make it a reality, it's you know, it's just not, it's just a thought, right? Um, leadership and coordination; these are different attributes of an entrepreneur. Do you need that in academia? Uh, perhaps you certainly have to coordinate. But uh, high achievement ca ca uh, capability or capacity. Um, it's kind of just being driven by success is is by my my view, um, uh, professional, organized, you know, 
uh, business oriented, right? So some of those are don't fit with academia, right? Um, other 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 just brief just uh, definitions, uh, you know. So uh, some of your leadership skills are required to start a small business, something that's scalable. Uh, setting up a business, creating a business, uh, and I think what's really important is is for you to be able to quantify um, a discovery or solution and how it might fit in the marketplace, because that has significant value. Uh, if you know, I'm going to end with this point, but it, I think that's an important take home lesson. And there there are actually some techniques and courses and. Uh, met methods, if you will, that'll teach you how to do that. So, um, not sure if you, you would agree with this, but um, here, here's what I feel a different, uh, is, is perhaps a definition of innovation. There, there are a lot of them, but it's, uh, I think it includes some uh, factors of an idea combined with some way of implementing that idea. I would also suggest that uh, the idea is just maybe one percent of that innovation. You know, ninety percent or more is implementation, and then how you evaluate, and refine it, and get it ready for the marketplace. So, a lot of us, obviously, yes, and that's probably why the great ninety-nine percent of these uh, ideas fail, right? So, very important to keep in mind. Um, and also wanted to, you know, kind of give you how we typically, or we think we can transition from academia to industry. Um, you know, so you, know, you, 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 you get an R1, you hire, <coughs> hire postdocs and students, and you know, maybe a three years into it, you come up with a discovery, a, a biomarker, a, a possible a drug target. So you start a company and you know, you license, you're supposed to license the technology to this new company you've created. Um, you know, you're, you know, you're, you have different areas of expertise and, you know, maybe hopefully you, you co collaborate with other scientists and, and, and physicians. Uh, and then your company is supposed to use uh, non-dilutive fund financing like SBIRs and STTRs, um, po possibly private equity with the hope of an exit, either an IPO or licensing to Big Pharma or, you know, God knows. And all the while you're using these external resources to kind of push things along. Friend, I don't include friends and family because, you know, my, my family and friends are, are poor and cheap. So that, that was never a route for me, maybe for you. Um, you know, I'm also- sorry, Dr. Lillard, we, we had a question in the um, Oh, I'm chat. so sorry. So could you- no, that's fine. Um, could you clarify? Oh, I'm, that was Morehouse School of MSM? Medicine. Morehouse School of Medicine. Yeah. That, that, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm give, give, just giving it from my perspective as a faculty and even a director of a tech transfer office at Morehouse School of Medicine. So Great, thanks. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it's, so this next slide also kind of goes over the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> What happens inside of an academic institution? You know, we get NIH funding, and, um, supports faculty and students, and supposed to disclose discoveries with a tech transfer office, committees, and processes eventually lead to uh, filing patents. And that, that's really, I feel, the currency, at least in biotech companies. Um, and eventually, we either form a company or look to license that technology out work with big pharma and private equity firms to fuel it all. So, you know, that's, that's the dream. The reality is actually quite different, <laughs> you know? So your, uh, your runway is actually quite, quite uh, short out of academia and you've got to quickly figure out ways to navigate what, what's called the valley of death, you know? Uh, beyond the amount of money you get from the public sector or federal dollars, for technology, um, and then how 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 one navigates that, and you you raise a private capital, you license your technology, and it's maybe a collaborative research and development agreement with a bigger company that helps move move the technology along. 
Um, it could be uh, if it's something really rapid, uh, uh, like a health tech or another device of sorts or software, maybe there's some kind of cost sharing approach as you develop um, uh, the tech, the software or a user group, right? Uh, or something like non-dilutive financing, like the Small Business Innovative Research Awards that NIH and many other federal agencies use. And I'm going to talk about that too. Um, yeah, so, you know, and here are the challenges. And, and it's also, I think, a misconception. You know, we think that, you know, academic scientists want to just discover and generate ideas. And a tech transfer officer like me wants to, you know, find a firm that I can license the technology to. And they're going to obviously recognize the significant value we bring. And there's everybody, you know, appreciates everyone's contribution to to this enterprise and that's never that's not the case in in my experience it's actually there's uh th these are supposed to so supposed to be compasses right so these magnifying glass all focus on the same being this red hot laser of shared value and equity in some enterprise but that's actually a lot of misalignment um all from academic scientists you know discovery is very different from development right Research is very, very different from development. Um, and then farm is also always wanting something, uh, something that's de been de-risked de by different, different uh, regulatory steps in the process. So, you know, what you end up finding is there's a lot of misalignment and which results in uh, difficulty finding value. And, you know, and, and, and you know, so you've got to figure out that sweet spot of identifying value of a technology, of the patents, of the of the the, the group you're working with, uh, the in, the end game uh, in order to raise capital. So that that's often a challenge. Um, and, and I'm and I'm not I'm not from I'm not sure of anyone's background, but you've probably seen slides similar to this and uh, kind of the regulatory and. Uh, R&D stages of a, um, bio, a biotherapeutic or a drug, you know, it takes several years to get to the market. Uh, diagnostic or medical device might take a lot, maybe four years, not eight or 10, maybe four, uh, and a little less money. And uh, different applications um, can be really, really fast turnaround, less than a year, depending on what, what type of expertise or what you're trying to do. Um, so, you know, the context and time differences really depends on one's approach, I feel, that you have to consider and how, how you partner, who you, who you work with, um, whether you license, whether you start a company, you know, I guess we can talk about that. Um, yeah, so what, here's one of the attributes I'm trying to, I was trying to find examples just in, um, you know what I do at Morehouse about this, but uh, you know high achievement capacity. So you know I, I, I work really hard so that Morehouse School of Medicine uh, and my own patents could be could be granted. Um, so you know this is this is a success story. So recognized by Fortune magazine as an HBCU, you know uh, historically black colleges and universities, historically you know kind of a um, little bit disenfranchised, but you know, not as many resources as say a Harvard or an MIT, but you know, we're, we're trying. Um, also, you know, so don't be afraid to fail. And this is that risk bearing um, attribute of the entrepreneur that may not be something you see in academia, right? Um, you know, we're, we're protected with tenure and um, we, you know, we can teach. Instead of getting competing for grants, you know, if you don't get your grant, you can always fall, fall back into teaching or some administrative role, right? Um, but entrepreneurs are typically, you know, risk takers. So th these are some of the companies I've been involved with over the years, and um, I'll well, I'll just point out here that should only Chinook, Complexa have drugs in phase three, two and three uh, clinical studies, so they're still on their way. 
Devmar Manufacturing now is, uh, is, is something we uh, co-developed with them, a uh, partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine and Devmar Products. Is, and we created a, a Devmar Manufacturing company that's uh, looking to get a product past an EPA regulatory hurdle. So that looks that's looking promising. Um, even my own giant technologies, uh, you know, um, good good science, but um, you know, very, very I didn't do a good good job at execution. Okay, and it's kind of uh, it's like one of the zombies here. The other ones are some of these are dead, uh, some of these are kind of the Walking Dead. <laughs> um, a citizen, I'm going to talk about is a success story, but let's keep going. Um, yeah, and you know, so here here are some of the. Um, um, companies along the way, and I used uh, SBIR grants to kind of, with either faculty or my own technologies, to de-risk the technology to kind of move things forward. Um, in there, you know, they're in different phases of development. Oh yeah, Neutral Global's doing okay, but um, yeah, need some help. Um, yeah, and, and some other ones, AccuHealth. Um, these are from app, these are apps, software, 4G genome developed software. Um, uh, another a device company, Accu, Accu Akumba Diagnostics. This is a biohazard cleanup product and others. Um, let's see. Yeah, so SBR grants, you know, so. Um, if you're going to take risks, you might as well use somebody else's money, right? So, I, and it's also important to collaborate um, with um, other ac ac academic scientists. You know, you can start a company, license technology from, you know, your own university. Uh, there's a lot of technology should sit on the shelf. You don't have to come up, you don't think you have to come up with your own idea, your own uh, discovery to to commercialize. You know, there's a lot of stuff on the shelf that you could add value to with your sweat equity and intellect. Uh, so th this is, these are some examples. So we you know we were actually really successful in terms of we and, we and at one time we had the most number of these grants for any any institution in the state of Georgia. So little old Morehouse School of Medicine. So again, don't be a be don't be afraid to fail, but um, if you're not risk bearing, at least risk somebody else's money, right? That's my model. So one of the one of the um, a great program you should learn more about is the uh, uh, the uh, small business innovation research or small business technology transfer program. You can actually uh, transfer technology not only from academic institutions but um, uh, federal agencies. Uh, 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 Federal National uh, Research Laboratories like uh, Oak Ridge National Labs or Frederick National Laboratory, Brookhaven, uh, they have tech transfer offices with really premium technology and laboratories that can de-risk the technology even further if need be. Um, or, you know, out of your own laboratory, a uh, company, uh, SBIR grants where you could write and get funding for Different things, and here, here, here's uh, here's some of the uh, what looks like the budget allocated from federal agencies. You know, and it's based on a percentage of uh, the SBA. So every entity, every federal agency has to put aside uh, ten percent towards the small business administration programs, and then this SBIR program is a percentage of that. And I, I forget the percentage, but it's it's significant. There's you know there's over three billion dollars. For SBIR and STTRs are half a billion, uh, and they're, they're they're in different flavors of either contracts or grants. Um, yeah, so I've, I've is uh, it's not easy money, but it's you know it's it's really good. It helps you develop your technology, and again, it's it's uh, non dilutive fund finance to to move your technology forward. I've got a question. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. That's Sorry, that, that, that wasn't a question, just a comment. Yeah, lots of money, lots of money. Yeah, and you know, so if you look at the, you know, you open up um, the instructions, they say, oh, you only asked for $150,000. But actually, I've, I've never put in a grant less than $300,000 for phase one. Um, and that's kind of prototype development, for example. Um, 
in just demonstrating proof of concept. Um, uh, phase two is more, it's less research and more development, right? And it can be, you can ask for uh, one, one and a half, two, three million, you know, it's, it's, it's very different. And then they even have certain, certain uh, institutes have commercialization stage where they'll partner with pharma and it'll help or, or, or even uh, VCs to help you get uh, uh, some uh, more, more uh, well, funding that would be diluted, I guess. All right, yeah, so I'm almost done. So also keep, keep learning, love, you gotta love learning. You're an academician anyway, so you, you do this anyway. And um, if you get the opportunity, I highly suggest you um, enter, enroll into an uh, I Corps, Innovation Corps, like Marine Corps training camp or train, training program. It's really like a boot camp. It's typically eight weeks in duration, and you're immersed into something with uh, one or two other partners, and you learn approaches of what's called customer discovery or de de developing a minimal viable product. Um, and it's all designed for you to listen to the customer and what product might fit in, how it would fit in the marketplace and what value it had. Okay. And um, I really took this for granted. You know, like we talked about the whole thing about, you know, a great idea is maybe 1% of it all, but the, 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 the development part and implementation really uh, is, should be focused on what the customer needs, not what you think is a great idea as a scientist. Um, but, you know, you go through this process and, and <clears throat> of asking multiple cus customers over and over um, what, what, what the need is. Um, and I'll just give you an example. So I, you know, as an immunologist, um, cancer researcher, I've developed, found a target, chemokine, it's, uh, that binds these uh, G protein coupled receptors, um, and, and it helps immune cells move around. Also, cancer cells move, uh, use it to move to lymph node and bone, we found. Um, so my, uh, you know, I had one thought in terms of who my customer were, was, and it was completely different, you know. It wasn't the urologist, it's actually the, the uh, uh, um, uh, chemo that's going to prescribe a chemotherapy or the antibody therapy, right? So something just as small as that really changes uh, what, what, what your um, technology use, needs to address. You also gain insights into uh, the customer utility, clinical utility, uh, and it really helps you determine what the value is. Anyway, um, just food for thought. Yeah, so I think I mentioned this previously, but you should, when possible, take the opportunity to serve on <laughs> advisory boards or study sections, you know, um, review SBIR, STTR grants if you can get, a, get on a study section. Uh, uh, small companies that are starting up, you know, sometimes you volunteer, you know, you'll get stock options, for example. You, uh, I, I strongly recommend that. You're, you're, all, you're giving back, you learn how to play well with others, but you're learning uh, using someone else's money, okay? I can't say that enough. Um, so this is, this is uh, I was involved with a company called Citizen, I like to think of it as a, um, a the LinkedIn for cancer patients. So social media platform um, that looks to enroll or recruit cancer patients. Uh, in exchange, they'll go out and, and curate, collect all of your medical records, including x-rays. And so you can have them on your iPhone or, or whatever. And then, and then uh, share them with your endocrinologist or the rheumatologist, so who all you know, all these doctors that have to treat for uh, patients with chronic diseases. So they uh, or we raised um, I don't know tw about twenty million to get up and running. Burnt, burned through that even during COVID. They were recently uh, acquired by Invite, uh, genetics company that's needing to cobble together companies that can quickly 
uh, collect and aggregate and structure clinical data married with um, genomic data, right? So anyway, and you know, this happened in like two, two, two years, so not, not a long period of time, but they create a lot of value. You can learn a lot and even make a little cash down the road. Um, also, it's important to give back, right? So this is, um, I worked with a colleague of mine, Angelita Howard at Morehouse School of Medicine. And <clears throat> through, my, through my adventures, I, I saw that there was a limited, um, a couple of things um, in terms of diversity, wasn't a lot of uh, diversity in the biotech industry, whether at the executive level, labs, you know, just um, very, very, you know, different, different look in terms of the community, say in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, also, <clears throat> a lot of the courses, well, a lot of things you learn in academia are it's academic, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not always practical or applied. So we created a, a master's in biotechnology, it's a completely online program. And really focused on the customer. The customer not only was the student, but who would hire them. We really paid a lot of attention to that. So this was actually an entrepreneurial effort. And using those same approaches, we ended up with the number one program, at least by intelligent.com, ahead of uh, schools like Hopkins and Harvard and Columbia. So I'm proud of that. And you know, using those same entrepreneurial approaches and get that, that willingness to give back uh, is also very important, I feel. Well, that's it. I hope that wasn't too painful. I, I'd rather answer questions anyway, but. Yeah, that was great, actually. Perfect, thanks a lot. Yeah, great slides. Um, yeah, so, so, so it sounds like you're open to taking questions. Um, so we can start with that. I don't know if anybody has any questions immediately um, that they'd uh, like to ask. Um, I've, I've got a question. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so um, in, in your experience, and, and this might vary maybe depending on who you're working with and um, the particular idea, but what has what is the most challenging part of the process from you know, the, the first part of the idea or the research all the way up to, you know, transitioning this to, um, or, or the exit strategy, what's the most difficult part of that process in your experience? Yeah, it's, it's um, finding, finding time. And that's been my, okay, just personally, I'm in, I'm in Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So, but if you're in Boston, the Bay Area, even Seattle, uh, San Diego, you know, uh, D, the DMV, there's the, 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 um, the ecosystem is a lot richer in nurturing, you know, the soils, you know, you know, it's been, because it's got a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of failures, a lot of successes in that, in, in, the, in those ecosystems. So you can, you learn from that just ubiquitous, you know, you just absorb things. So, and, and there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs or advisors for possibly your company that are, you know, sitting on a bench and are available to you or accessible. They have, they have, they've interacted with the schools locally or venture funds, you know, so it's like a whole ecosystem. So what what's challenging if you, if you're not in that an ecosystem like that is finding the know-how of executives, people that have done it before, like a CFO that's raised capital before, or that's done an IPO, or um, they can help help you with um, your pro forma if you if you, you haven't done that before. Um, that can assess what your what your your net present values, you know, how much your company's worth, how much you should. Um, how much how much capital should you take for equity in your company? Um, look, I mean, things like that to even um, regulatory expertise and how to navigate some at the FDA or the EPA or whatever uh, agency you're trying to navigate. So 
that's that's been frustrating to me. Um, but you know, uh, you know, I think with even the pandemics made that may have eliminated some of that barrier because now people are much more apt to you know get on Zoom and you can Zoom with somebody in Boston or San Diego, you know, whoever wherever the expert is, wherever in the world they might be, it's a lot easier to connect now. So maybe that I hope that answers your question. And, and, and so really quick follow up, how do you uh, like find those types of resources, you know, like somebody like a CFO or somebody with, you know, knowledge on how to, you know, navigate the EPA or, or, or whatever, right? Like if, if somebody, you know, doesn't have any clue, like how to actually like, you know, navigate that process and find these types of resources, then do you, do you have any kind of advice or suggestions for, for how to get started with that? Yeah. Yeah, at the state level, typically cities um, or state level, there are federal a, federal agencies. Um, um, like for uh, Georgia Research Alliance, it's a uh, it's actually a state funded entity, but it's all it's all aligned. All their goal is to uh, provide resources for. Uh, 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 STEM or tech entrepreneurs to get their to get their companies off the ground or get technologies out of universities into the marketplace. So there are a lot of resources there. Uh, there are um, um, there 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 are these uh, there oh goodness this, uh, well there are these clinical trial science awards and there's something called FAST programs, I forgot what F-A-S-T stands for, but there are programs also aligned to connecting scientists, STEM entrepreneurs with resources to move their technology forward. And that's everything from the actual technology off the shelf to uh, re you know, scientists with laboratories to uh, uh, state funds that might support a startup to SBIR grant writing support to even angel investors and VCs. Yes, Marcia. So my question to you is what was the most helpful to you in hmm. the process? Wow, let's see. It's all it's. I'm struggling because it's all. Been, nothing is easy for an entrepreneur. <laughs> no, it's not. Nothing's easy, but and so any help has been great, right? Um, well, but I, I tell you, it's it's always helpful to find find someone that's done it before, even failed before, or hopefully succeeded before, um, and just learn from them. You got to absorb their knowledge. Um, um, so for example, the, 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 the example with Citizen was easy. The, the founder was actually a serial entrepreneur, had experience at Apple, you know, had, had, you know, had the resources and, uh, that ecosystem around him of other, uh, serial entrepreneurs. So he was able to quickly raise those that series, uh, the angel round, angel angel round, the series A round, and before I knew it, it was you know sold the company. All right, um, uh, something. You know, the other thing is you got to. Um, I, it's really important to collaborate. Um, it's a team. This is a team sport. You can't. You know, academia again. <clears throat> it's kind of this mentality of. Uh, uh, it, you know, investigator initiated, right? Independent, you know, all these things, all these little catchphrases we used to use. But entrepreneurship is a team, is really a team sport, uh, as is team science, but entrepreneurship, you absolutely need a team around you. So getting, uh, they don't have to be the very best, but at least those that are committed to the cause and uh, coupling that with expertise with your, doesn't have to be board of directors, but your your scientific or medical advisors, super critical. You pick the right team, you 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 have your you increase your uh, chance of success tenfold. You know. 
So you mentioned about like having support of people that have done it before. Did you have like a mentor? And can you comment on like mentors or advisors that if that was helpful to you? Or anything? Um, oh yeah, yes. Um, yeah, every step of the way. Um, you know, you know, again, the, the ones that have done it before, that have maybe retired from industry or have, have attempted something and failed, have been the, you know, the best teachers. <laughs> so I, I and, and every, you know, I can't, I can't just give one example, but every example of that has been, has been fruitful. Even someone that's maybe failed in a venture. I've had a lot of failures too. <laughs> So I let you learn from those failures. Hi, uh, Dr. Lillard, great talk. I uh, just had a question about the valley of death. A lot of us fellows are working in government offices and we're getting to see firsthand how our office may impact different types of technologies. Um, I'm curious, what is it that you use to navigate through the valley of death in your companies? And what is something that the government could uh, do something uh, to help navigate more entrepreneurs to be successful in that realm. Yeah, the the um, again the SBIR SCTR program uh, help with that. Um, I wish I wish it was a faster um, cycle to get funding though. Um, what I didn't talk about is you know you. Imagine it takes you, they say it only takes you 10 hours to write one of these grants. Okay, that might be true. But it obviously takes a lot of past performance and preliminary data that you may take a year, you may have uh, accumulated over the years. But you send in something, it goes to a review committee of your peers, scientific peers, and maybe three months after you send it in, it's reviewed, it's scored. Hopefully, you get a great score. Then, Three months later, it goes to an advisory panel uh, that, that looks at all the, high, the, score, the grants that were scored high and decides what they're going to fund. And then maybe three months later, you'll get your funding. So nine months, you know. Uh, for, so for the entrepreneur, that could be an eternity. So I wish the SBI pro, SBIR program could be shortened somehow, but you know, um, that's, that, that's perhaps the reality. Um, uh, you know, also that the i program, so NSF made it, uh, you know, it's really popular at the National Science Foundation, but um, it'd be great if other agencies uh, would adopt it. And NIH is doing it now, but you have to have received SBIR funding in order to get into the program. But in fact, I think you need it before you even apply for a grant. But uh, that that's something I, uh, a change that could have some impact. <clears throat> okay. So, so do you have any thoughts? I think you had mentioned really briefly about the um, you know, diverging paths of either trying to start a company or just trying to like license uh, mm -hmm. an idea. Like, is it so? So, is one easier? Is one more lucrative? Is one preferable for certain types of things? Do you think it depends on your at your uh, um, gosh. How resilient, you know what what you what what you're to, what you'll tolerate the risks that you're willing to accept, you know. Um, I you know I think if if I were to do it over again, I I would have really searched a lot harder for a a small business partner or a mid sized company that all they did was think about how to move a technology down the road instead of starting a small business and doing it myself. You know, because, you, you know, by the way, you're going to have, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're a scientist, you're going to have lots of ideas. You think, you know, you may think you're young, you think, oh, this is 
the best idea, you know, may never have another one, but you're going to have lots of them, right? So the thing is to uh, don't be stingy with it, but at the same time, um, partner strategically. You don't want to just give it away either, but um, realize that you're going to have something down the road. I wish I had uh, partnered with um, uh, an experienced entrepreneur, gave away more of the company, of the equity earlier to learn from those. Uh, you, you will learn from the mistakes and the successes, right? Uh, that's what I would have done differently, if that makes sense. You're going to have lots of uh, lots of ideas, uh, you know, too many ideas, not enough, not enough time or money to ex to exploit them. <laughs> in my in my experience, is that another question to follow up on that? As an entrepreneur, um, were you planning with the end in mind? This was made uh, famous by Steve Covey. Uh, uh, famous American educator, but he mentions in his habits to plan for the end in mind. So were you thinking for your businesses that you were going to um, go into manufacturing of those products or were you thinking about scaling it so that you're going to have an exit strategy of just IP acquisition? What um, were your yeah, you, you, also? It's a good question. In fact, when you talk to, well, when most of the investors I talk to, they want, you have to have a clear vision from start to, to finish all the way to the, to the marketplace and even how you're going to deploy and sell and scale. So, you know, even though the reality is, at least in, uh, you know, in biopharma, you'll probably exit or sell it, you know, if you reach phase two, you know, clinical studies, it looks promising, you'll probably a nice uh, inflection point that you could sell or, or you know, uh, still be involved with the company, but at least be uh, you know, taken up by the, uh, some big pharma. But you, you, know, but you, you have to um, communicate and plan for going all the whole, the whole, the whole way. Yeah. So, so sort of going off of that question, um, I've heard that flexibility, uh, the your adapt maybe adaptability is maybe a better description, is really mm -hmm. important in these environments. Is that uh, something from your experience that you had a set trajectory and then you ended up pivoting um, somewhere in the middle of that and, and going in a different direction? And um, have you had that experience or or known oh. of, of those? And and how how did that play out? How did that decision process go about? And Mm -hmm. um, yeah well yeah you got you've got to be ready you got to be flexible you've got to listen to the customer sometimes you know in hindsight um little it could be too hard-headed and you know trying to force your product in a market or environment that's just not going to accept it um and then when you're when you're flexible, you know you end up finding more uh, channels, revenue channels, more more ways to exploit your technology if you're receptive to it. You know, like um, again, again, a monoclonal antibody drug to chemokinase study. I was you know kind of focused on the uh, prostate cancer, for example. All right, but um, and guess what? It's it's also important in lupus. Right, so I uh, probably should have pivoted sooner towards something like that. Um, with uh, the company I'm working with now, Devmar Manufacturing, um, we we were, uh, but but you know we didn't we we pivoted, but we we were initially focused on uh, these. It's about it's essentially the super absorbent powder that we could load with a disinfectant. Believe it or not, nothing else is out there. You know, so it's like. Uh, you know, you would you instead of having to mop up or throw towels on a biohazardous spill, vomit, blood, diarrhea, you know, which is what really happens in the field, you can just throw a powder on it. Five minutes later, you can scoop it up or sweep it up as opposed to having to mop it up, and you're and it's it kills anything it takes up. Uh, so we were focused on, um, you know, 
just any gram negative, any gram positive, clostridium. But COVID happened, right? So we quickly pivoted. Well, not, not could have probably did a better job, but we pivoted as well as we could during the pandemic. And that's it's really uh, increased the value of the company because we, you know, we just have, we, you know, some of us luck, but we were also willing to pivot, right? And take, um, take advantage of this, this new normal. Because now any, any, any biohazard spill, a cough is like, you know, it's, it's life-threatening now. Uh, so anyway, yes, pivot, flexibility. So how do you keep that flexibility? Uh, you stretch every day. No. Um, you know, I, 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 you just, it's a willingness. You, you, have to, you have to enter in that way too. Um, now, some, you know, you, you have to know your limits at the same time. You know, you can't, some, sometimes your, your technology won't pivot or flex in that direction or your shareholders won't give or um, it's just not, you know, not, maybe not profitable. You, you do have to take with a grain of salt. What about um, conflicts that you've had with, mm -hmm. especially people that what is it, are, are involved early in the project? And so there's maybe a more personal stake in it, as well as um, people with financial stakes. How, how do you approach any, any conflicts uh, as you go through the process? Uh, transparency, um, every, you know, state your, you know, your goal. If you're a founder, state your goal, even have in mind, you know, in the end of the day, you know, depending on the stage, you're, you're going to end up diluting yourself as a, you may start with a hundred percent, but if you make it to the market in farm, you, you may end up with 10% of the company or less. And it's just the way of things. So you have to be comfortable with that. Um, just so knowing, knowing where things could end up. Um, also, and if you're, if you're assigning, uh, uh, sharing equity with, um, say an advisor, make sure everything is, um, you know, requires vesting, uh, requires them to show some level of commitment before, you know, don't, don't hand a guy. It's like, I don't know if you've ever been involved in construction or hire somebody to fix your, your sink or I don't know, your car. Would you pay a guy? I don't know, it's a thousand dollar job. Are you going to pay him a thousand dollars, you know, before he starts? No, you kind of pay him at the end of the job, right? Or every year there's a new, um, uh, you know, options that, you know, mature annually. So, you know, still a business. So you don't want to, you don't want to give it away either. So that's kind of how I handle, I've handled, I've learned to deal with that because you can get into, um, you can run into some sticky situations when you uh, shell out equity early on too, too early. Lot, lots of problems. So, uh, so you've got a, a lot of experience now with um, with starting up and helping to develop companies. Um, but it, like early on, you know, how do you know like when you have an idea that it's going to pop, right? Like, how do you know when you've got something that you could really like form a, a, a company around? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I listen. I swear by that I Corp program. I wish it was around 15 years ago when I was really. Getting getting started in this, you, you must take it. It, it de risks your as not. I mean, it's like it, it would have been the smartest thing for me to do have done was to really get an understanding of the whole landscape of the product I'm trying to place in the marketplace. What we do is we we make a lot of assumptions and and guess what? You may have a Nobel laureate as an advisor, and he that and that's that n of one. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't come up to a scientific, scientific conclusion on an N of one. You need 
multiple data points. So that that program or that process, that customer discovery process forces you to ask lots of questions to lots of people, the, to lots of potential customers. And you, at the end of the day, you end up with, you know, you know exactly uh, the characteristics of your product that will be required to get it approved or for it to be successful in the marketplace. So i core i core i core and in fact we you know we have that as part of uh we have a three credit hour health science capstone practicum for our online masters in biotech and online masters in health informatics uh, course uh and it's completely on it's online so you can take it from anywhere a lot of those i cores you have to take it um you have to go to a place and um you know, sit in a room. <laughs> so, but, but uh, it may not, it may, it's not always available in different locations. So, um, so we've got a, a virtual one that you could take as well. So th there's a lot of technical components to this. I'm like, you know, the legal components and uh, yeah. uh, investors and everything. Um, I, so i -Corps, it sounds like is a great resource for that. Are there others? Like, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I look at this like, oh, I'll read a book about how to do this. But from your what you're saying, it sounds like there might be components of that that you can learn, but that it's a lot of yeah, yeah. it's a lot of um, person to person uh, interactions. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. are, are yeah. there? Oh, are just, there? I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Before yeah, before I forget, you just reminded me of something important. You know, when you when you start a company, is you obviously have to have you have to have a corporate attorney that represents your company right but it's so it's also important that you get almost a personal attorney that can represent your interest as a founder or as the chief scientific officer you know um what i um that's that's something i've seen fall apart in other companies when they the the founder the entrepreneur wasn't really protected he, and his old company took advantage of him, you know, so, or her, her, you know, so yeah, that's, um, don't, don't, think, don't, uh, attorneys can be your friend, but, you know, uh, they, it, corporate attorneys can turn again, you know, you know, their, their interest is your company, not, not you as the individual. So take that into consideration. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, I was, yeah, I guess my question was like, do you, do you have any any recommended resources to read up about like the very basics of this process um or if there are other online courses or anything that that we can utilize yeah um there's a kaufman um k k a u f m a n n kaufman fast track um program um that's a that's a course you can look up in it's often it's offered at universities and it's um, it's eight weeks and you learn the whole you know the whole process of uh, taking something to market the finance the how to engage uh, with company uh, with uh, uh, how to incorporate how to how to engage with um, uh, investors um, how do you talk to companies that you know it, it really does a good job of showing you the whole landscape uh, also um autumn um gosh association for university tech trend uh, was technology managers i believe that's that's the acronym or les licensing executive society um they have these annual conferences and what's interesting they have a workshop typically at the beginning of these conferences where you just no, those are like boot camps so you spend two days, eight hours every day. So I don't know, six, 10 to 16 hours in total where you get immersed in it and you, it's like a boot camp to learn about bio entrepreneurship. Um, and that, those were really helpful. So if I, if I had coupled that with i -Corps, I would have been well equipped to, you know, start my venture. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, so we want to be respectful of uh, of Dr. Lillard's time. Um, note that it's, that the presentation's been an hour um, already. I don't know if there's 
any like last final um, burning questions that anybody um, wants to throw out there really quick before we depart? Um, but if, if not, I, I want to say this has been great, I think. Um, your slides were awesome, Dr. Lillard. And um, we're very appreciative that you've uh, you know, you spent time taking questions from us. Um, and so um, I, I think it's been a really successful and valuable um, um, meeting and event. And so I want to you know, take a, a moment to, to thank you. And I'm sure that everybody here really appreciates your time and um and uh, you know your effort and the, the knowledge that you've presented to us you're too kind well thank thanks for listening you know uh, advice is uh is only as good as what you pay for so you know i don't know take, take everything i say with a grain of salt so yeah sure of course right of course. <laughs> so good luck to good, good luck to all of you and you know if you have any questions feel free to i'm on linkedin or Google, like I'm, I'm easily um, approachable. So, if you have any questions? Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and I'll remind people that we we've been recording uh, this session, so you know you can go back and rewatch your favorite parts. Um, <laughs> and uh, otherwise, is there anything else that that we need to to finish up, Marcia or or Michael or Clifton? No, I think we're all good. Thank you, Dr. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, great. Well, thanks a lot again. And um, I'll I'll stop the recording and then we can um, we can depart. All right. Bye.